One of the main mechanics in Magic is the color wheel, and through it, the color of cards. The majority of Magic cards have a color, and a ton of cards care about the color of cards. It's no wonder that Wizards would experiment with color changing effects, and eventually the Devoid mechanic, which makes cards colorless. However, these have never really been all that good. Today, we're going to go over these mechanics and explain why they failed. Color changing has been around for as long as Magic has been a game. In the very first set, there was a cycle of cards like Thought Lace, which could change the color of spells or permanents for just one mana. There was one of these cards for each of the five colors of Magic, and none of them have ever been even remotely playable. It's worth stating up front that changing the color of a card doesn't do anything intrinsically. The colors don't come with unseen changes to the mechanics of a card. Red creatures don't intrinsically have haste or anything silly like that. So the only way for changing the color of a card to matter is if a lot of cards care about it. And for what it's worth, a lot of cards in early Magic did care about the color of cards. In only ABU or Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited, there were a ton of cards that interacted with color. White had the Ward Cycle, which were one mana auras that gave the enchanted creature protection from one color. This would prevent that creature from being blocked, targeted by, damaged by, or enchanted by anything of that color. On that note, early on in the game, protection was pretty much limited just to protection from colors. Cards like Terror and Black would only destroy creatures that were non-black. So if you could change the color of a creature you controlled to black in response to a Terror, you could save it from that removal spell. This means that color changing effects had a lot of scenarios where they might come up. Despite this, none of these color changing cards really saw any play. None of the Lace cards ever did anything in competitive settings, and the few similar cards that did see play basically always saw play for unrelated reasons. Cerulean Wisps did see a lot of play in some combo decks for its ability to untap a creature and draw you a card for one mana, regardless of its color changing ability. Even cards that can change the color of a card multiple times, like Distorting Lens, haven't been playable, despite being able to mess with the color of cards every turn. If this effect was good enough to be worth playing, it would have done something by now. But no matter how strong Wizards makes a card with this ability, it never does do anything. Why is it that, despite there being plenty of cards that care about color, and plenty of cards that can change color, they've never been worth playing? The answer comes into view when we consider how these cards would play together. Let's say you have a card like Fry, which can deal 5 damage to target blue slash white creature, or Planeswalker for 2 mana, and can't be countered. This was a powerful piece of interaction, and being able to use it on any creature Planeswalker rather than only ones of the right colors would be very good. A color changing card like Distorting Lens could allow you to change a card's color every turn to turn on cards like Fry and its contemporaries. This would allow you to effectively completely get around the downside of cards like Fry, which would be incredibly powerful, if not for a few issues. First off, if you don't have a color changing effect, all of your color based cards won't do anything. Sure, cards like Fry and Aether Gust are very powerful, but if your opponent is on the wrong color deck and you haven't found your lens yet, your cards won't do anything at all in your hand. On top of that, if you draw your color changing effects, they won't do anything either. So, if you tried to build your deck this way, you would have a deck that was very bricky and would draw lots of hands that just wouldn't do anything. To mention that this would also give your deck a huge choke point where a single card could ruin your entire plan. If you're relying on Distorting Lens to turn all your color based cards on, a single Shatter effect would leave you hung up to dry. This means that, even if this strategy were powerful enough to be worth playing, it would be so fragile that it would be basically really easy to counter. Of course, this isn't strong enough to be worth doing, which leads us to the second issue. If you try to use color changing effects to buff your color based cards, you'll be using two cards to play a buff version of a spell, which isn't actually all more powerful than what other cards can do. If you use Distorting Lens to turn on your Fry, you're dealing a total of 5 damage to a permanent. However, you could use a card like Torbrand, Thrain of Redfell, to pump your Lightning Bolt to 5 damage, as well as making all your other red cards more powerful. Or you could cast a Lava Coil for the same amount of mana as just casting Fry, and deal one less damage. While Fry is far above rate, using even one more mana to turn it on will make it only average or sometimes even worse than other available options in most formats. This is true for most color dependent cards. Sure, you can use Lens to make your White Knight better by making creatures black, but the mana used on Lens could be used casting Swords to Plowshares, or developing another threat, or doing anything else more worthwhile. Simply put, the payoff for these color changing effects isn't high enough because color hosing effects aren't above rate enough to make them worth playing. The important thing here is that it's not just the case that the payoff isn't there, but also that wizards can't print color hosers strong enough to make it worth it. The main role of cards like Aether Gust is to be brought in from the sideboard in certain matchups. These cards are only supposed to be good against certain decks, not complete game winners. 
If you make them more powerful to make them better with color changing cards, you'll also make them back breaking out of the sideboard. In order to make this weird color based deck, you'd have to make the game far more swingy and make a ton of games that are determined by who drew their sideboard card first. The final issue with these color changing effects is that it's not worth using them to get the upside of the colored base cards. For an example, if you're trying to use a card like Sylvan Anthem to buff your board, you could then use color changing effects to make any color creature receive the Anthem's boost. However, this is essentially using two cards to give a creature a plus one plus one, which isn't really worth it. When decks have played color dependent buff cards, they just only played cards that were the right color. It's far better to simply play only green creatures to maximize the value off of your Sylvan Anthem than it is to use Life Lace to buff a random non-green creature. All in all, this means there's no payoff for playing color changing cards that's high enough to justify playing them. Throughout the years, Wizards has printed a number of cards that change colors that have been playable, though few of them saw play because they could change color. The previously mentioned Cerulean Wisps and cards like it could not have had their color changing effect at all, and would still have been more than playable. However, there are a few cards that ended up being very powerful, and whose color changing effects actually came up now and then. The first were a few threats who had a color changing effect, namely Wild Mongrel and Spirit Monger. Wild Mongrel is a 2-2 dog with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green. It is ability where you can discard a card to give Mongrel plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. But you can also choose a color and turn Mongrel into that color until the end of turn. Spirit Monger is a 6-6 beast with a mana cost of 3, 1 black and 1 green. It has the abilities where, whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. You can pay 1 black to regenerate the Monger, meaning that the next time the creature would be destroyed this turn, it isn't, you tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. Finally, you can also pay one green to make it a creature of any color until the end of turn. Both of these creatures were already one of the best threats in their respective standards. Mongrel was used as part of a madness deck. This keyword allowed you to cast a card whenever you discarded it for its madness costs. These madness costs were often at quite a discount, and cards like Mongrel could let you get this madness cost whenever you wanted. Spirit Monger, likewise, was just a very impressive stat line for the time. A 6-6 for 5 mana was unheard of all the way back in Apocalypse when the card was printed. The fact that the card had multiple upsides on top of its impressive stat line just made this card incredible back in the day. The color changing effect could not have been on the cards, and they likely would have still seen play. But having the ability was a nice upside in a lot of scenarios. Dodging Terror was the main use of these abilities, but getting around protection abilities and the like also came up pretty often. Similar to other generally weaker effects, color changing was only good if you weren't really losing anything to get it. There is one color changing effect that has ended up being incredibly powerful due to its ability to change the color of cards, that being Painter's Servant. This is a 1-3 Scarecrow artifact creature with the abilities where, as it enters the battlefield, you choose a color and all cards that aren't on the battlefield, all spells, and all permanents are that chosen color, in addition to their other colors. This effect on its own doesn't really do anything, like most color changing effects. However, it happens to have a perfect partner in Grindstone. This is an artifact that costs 1 mana and has the ability where you can pay 3 and tap it to make target player mill 2 cards. If those cards share a color, they repeat this process. This can be repeated any number of times, so if all the cards in someone's deck share a color, a single grindstone activation will entirely mill someone out. A two card kill is quite good. So it's not surprising that this is the only time that changing colors alone of your opponent's cards has ever been playable. These mechanics have been in the game for a long time, and have done little that entire time. You'd think they wouldn't make this kind of mistake again, but for some reason, Wizards rolled out with a new color based mechanic that never did anything. In Battle for Zendikar, Wizards released the Devoid mechanic. This is a keyword that made it so that a card was colorless, even if it had a colorless mana in its cost. This was a mechanic that only appeared on the Eldrazi and Eldrazi aligned spells. It was sort of the opposite of the color changing and color matters mechanics, and it had many of the same kinds of support cards. Cards like Herald of Kozilek could reduce the cost of all your colorless spells by one, Ruination Drone gave all your colorless creatures plus one plus zero, and Forerunner of Slaughter can give any colorless creature haste. This was also very similar to artifact support cards, which had often been quite good. Artifacts are usually colorless, so most of these cards would also work with artifacts. There are a few things of note here. For one, Devoid, like color changing mechanics, didn't actually do anything in game. It would only do something if there were other cards that cared about a card's color. Luckily for Devoid, colorless support cards have been very strong at certain points in the game. For example, cards like Ancient Stirrings have seen play for years, and at one point, people called for the card to be banned thanks to how strong it was. Mystic Forge works with both artifacts and colorless cards, and is so good in vintage that it has been restricted to one copy. 
both of these cards work specifically with colorless cards. Additionally, Artifact Focus decks see play all over the place. Affinity and other similar decks have seen play for years in formats like Modern. Unlike with color changing cards, the issue with Devoid wasn't entirely the card's design. There exists a version of the Devoid mechanic that was powerful and likely remembered fondly. So, where did things go wrong? The main issue ended up being confusion. But to get why this is so confusing, we have to cover a lot of ground. First off, the vast majority of Devoid cards are just normal spells that happen to be colorless. Void Shatter is a counter spell that exiles the card it counters. Fathom Feeder was just a 2 mana death touch creature with a mana sink on it, and Flame Tendrils was just a drowned sorrow effect with an exile attached to it. We can go on, but the point is that a majority of the Devoid spells didn't interact with each other in any meaningful way. They were just normal spells you'd find in a set with a mostly irrelevant coat of paint. There also wasn't quite enough payoffs for playing Devoid spells. We've already talked a lot about how low rarity payoffs for playing Devoid spells like Forerunner of Slaughter, but unfortunately, those were really the only payoffs that existed. There were four high rarity cards that cared about your creatures specifically being colorless in the set. Gruesome Slaughter, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, Sanctum of Ugin, and Ruins of Orin Reef. Of these cards, the only notable one was Sanctum of Ugin, which would eventually see playing ramp decks in modern. That doesn't mean the Aldrazi were hung up dry in terms of support, however. It's just that most of that support were cards like Kozilex Return, which has a graveyard effect that triggers when you cast an Eldrazi creature with a mana value of 7 or more. This may lead you to ask, why doesn't the card trigger off of colorless spells? Especially considering that the majority of colorless cards in the set were Eldrazi? This is the question that most players were asking around the release of Battle for Zendikar block. The Eldrazi support was split evenly between caring about Eldrazi creatures specifically and caring about colorless cards for seemingly no reason. This did end up mattering a bit in Standard once the Artifact Focus block Kaladesh released, but at the time, it was a mostly meaningless distinction. This was made even more strange by the fact that the Eldrazi had already shown up once back in the Rise of Eldrazi. And in that set, they were colored Eldrazi, making the flavor argument a lot weaker. The end result was a keyword that didn't affect gameplay at all, didn't denote the boundaries of a specific archetype, and didn't need to exist because there was already a way to tie all the cards together, their creature type. This led most of the players to question why Devoid was even in the set at all. From a design perspective, this is also a strange decision because it increases the amount of information players need to keep in mind for no reason. The Eldrazi and Battleblock were already kind of all over the place. They cared about exiling and unexiling cards, cared about making a ton of mana and being huge, cared about producing Eldrazi Scion tokens, and also introduced a new mana symbol in the colorless symbols. Adding a fifth mechanic the tribe cared about in a two cent block just left them feeling messy and all over the place. You could redesign the set with Devoid removed and all the cards that care about colorless cards caring about Eldrazi instead, and almost nothing would be lost. It felt like wizards added text to cards purely for the sake of it, or to draw even more attention to how different the Eldrazi were from the inhabitants of Zendikar. However, I think players would have been able to figure that out without the keywords by just looking at the art or possibly the fact that they were featured on cards with names like Gruesome Slaughter. While the mechanic was weak, it wasn't just this weakness that made it noteworthy. It was how confused and out of place the mechanic felt that ultimately left players disappointed with the mechanic. Despite Devoid not tying any sort of deck together, there were a lot of cards with Devoid that were strong. They were just all played in completely different decks. One group of Devoid cards that saw a lot of play together were Catacomb Sifter, Blister Pod, and Smothering Abomination. Sifter is a 2-3 for 1, 1 black, and 1 green. And he has the ability where, when it enters the battlefield, you make an Eldrazi Scion token, which you can sacrifice to add a colorless mana. It also has the ability where whenever a creature you control dies, you scry one. This allows you to look at the top card of your library, then either place on the top or bottom of your library. Blister Pod is a 1-1 for green that makes an Eldrazi Scion token when it dies, and Smother and Abomination is a 4-3 for 2 and 2 black. It has flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying, and has the abilities where, whenever you sacrifice a creature, you draw a card and during your upkeep you have to sacrifice a creature. All of these were cards which gave you a payoff for creatures dying, so it's probably not a surprise that they were played together. Zulaport Cutthroat shared the same standard as these cards and allowed you to drain life from your opponent whenever one of your creatures dies. This allowed you to keep yourself healthy while generating a ton of value off of your smothering abominations. Sifter made the interaction even better by letting you stack your draws, and Blister Pod was just the best one mana creature to sacrifice, as it gives you a second creature once it died. Another card that saw a lot of play around this time was Eldrazi Displacer. This is a 3-3 Eldrazi for 2-1 white. It is the ability where you can pay 2-1 colorless mana to exile another target creature. 
then return it to the battlefield tapped. This ability is both powerful and versatile, which is why it has seen so much play in so many different decks. You usually play it in decks with creatures with enter the battlefield effects, such as Reflector Mage. With both of these cards in the field, you could just pay 3 mana to bounce your opponent's creatures whenever you wanted. This was not only one use of the card though, as if your opponent used a removal spell on one of your creatures, you could just blink it to save it from removal. You could even blink your opponent's creatures to just stop them from attacking. All of these different uses for the card allow the card to not only see played standard, but in multiple other formats. The final Devoid card we're talking about is Inverter of Truth. This is a 6-6 with flying for 2 and 2 black. However, it has the massive downside where, when it enters the battlefield, you exile your library. Then you shuffle your graveyard into your library. While this was probably intended to be a high risk, high reward threat, it was actually used in combo decks. There were multiple cards like Jace, Wilder Mysteries, and Thassa's Oracle, which could win you the game if your deck was empty. If you had few to no cards in your graveyard, Inverter could essentially get rid of your deck and allow one of those combos to win the game. This was so powerful and consistent that Inverter was even banned in Pioneer. While the mistakes that were made were ultimately different, the color-changing cards in Devoid shared a common inspiration. Color was one of the most fundamental mechanics in Magic, so it makes sense to make mechanics that interact with that. However, the fundamental issue with this idea is that color doesn't actually matter that much in turn-by-turn -turn gameplay. Color determines what cards you can play and what effects you'll have access to, but once you cast the cards, their color rarely matters. In order to make either of these mechanics important in any way, you have to print a ton of cards like Herald of Kozilek or Sylvan Anthem that care about color. But that often runs into its own problems. Even if you had made Devoid less confusing and designed the cards more sensibly, the Devoid mechanic still wouldn't have had legs in the constructed format. The payoffs simply weren't high enough to be better than casting Gideon, Ally, and Zendikar back in Standard. Magic, as a game, has a very hard time making clusters of cards work together unless those cards directly synergize with each other. It's easy to make a plus one plus one counter deck work, you just print good cards with counters and good cards that give counters. However, caring about something like color that doesn't directly impact gameplay requires far more work. It requires much more heavy-handed design than Wizards is often comfortable with as it's very easy to make a deck that just does far too much. Devoid may have had a chance to see play, but it would have required far more support than a few cards that look for colorless cards, and one land that fixed your mana. Color changing cards were essentially always doomed, as we previously mentioned, as they ran up against too many other cards in the game. Over time, Wizards has moved further and further away from mechanics that care about color. Protection from colors has become more and more rare over time, and abilities like Intimidate have slowly been phased out. These cards made matches feel arbitrary, randomly punishing players for happening to choose a certain deck. But this shift in design makes these types of mechanics even less likely to work. While we may see more cards that care about color seen play in the future, these specific approaches to design have worn out their welcome. 